today. I would just give it a few seconds. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope that everybody who has registered in advance uh, has now found their way into our digital space today. And in the name of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the Mercata Institute for China Studies, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our online seminar on the topic of uh, China's growing security role in Africa, youth from West Africa, implications for Europe. My name is Anna Wasserfall and I am the policy advisor for Western Africa and security here at CAS in Berlin, from where I'm also broadcasting to you today. Um, it'll be my pleasure to guide you to our session today. And um, in that in that matter, I would just like to briefly touch on a few technical points um, before we start. Uh, seeing that we have quite a high number of participants for today's event and that we have a fairly limited time frame. Uh, we can unfortunately not enable a verbal communication between our audience and um, the speakers. And I would therefore like to ask you to um, use the two communication tools that are provided. Uh, and that is mainly the chat function and the Q&A box, which you should both be able to find at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, so quickly, the chat function should be used. That is the, the function with a little speech, speech bubble symbol. And that should please be utilized for all your technical and uh, procedural questions, such as if you cannot hear or see me properly, if you have any questions regarding the language or the procedure of the event, then kindly post your questions here and my colleagues will be more than happy to assist you. If however you have um, a content related question or a question that you would like to direct one of our speakers instantly, uh, you can please do that through the Q&A function, which you can find right next to the chat function. Um, you can do that at any given time of the event. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session later. Uh, you can ask your questions during the presentation, during the panel discussion, and we are going to collect them and uh, tackle them during the Q&A session later. Um, as I mentioned, we are quite a lot of participants today, so I have my doubts that we are going to be able to tackle all of your questions. And um, in that matter, I would actually like to ask you, the audience, uh, to assist us in prioritizing the issues that you find most important. Um, and you can do that by so-called uprating the questions that have already been put in the Q&A box. Um, my colleagues will quickly show you how that works. We are going to run a test. If you open your Q&A box now, you should see that a test question has been posed or is being posed. And on the lower left hand side of that question, there is a little thumbs up symbol. If you click on that symbol, if you like the question, if you find it relevant, if you would like it to be answered, then that question automatically goes up in terms of ranking. So the more likes a question has, uh, the more relevant it will be and the higher up it will appear in the Q&A box. And seeing that I am going to ask the questions in the order that they are going to appear in the box, it is up to you um, to engage with the questions that have been posed and rank them accordingly. Um, just one more thing, if you would like to ask a question to one of our panelists specifically, then uh, kindly name that person alongside with your question. Um, finally, just a brief disclaimer, as was mentioned in the reminder email that we sent out to all of you, um, we are going to record this event uh, because we would like to broadcast or make it available on our homepage later. So just for you to know, so much for the technicalities. Uh, now we can get to the actual interesting part of today's event. Uh, before we get into the presentation and panel discussion, I would of course like to introduce uh, my fellow speakers to you today. As you can see, we have a number of experts with us uh, who are going to provide different sets of insights and perspective on the topic at hand. Firstly, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Honorable Markus Koop. He has been a member of the Christian Democratic Union of Germany since 1995 and is a member of the German Bundestag since uh, 2013. Amongst other things, he is a standing member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and within this institution is the responsible rapporteur for West and Central Africa, questions regarding the African Union and the Sahel Initiative. We are very happy that he took time out of his very busy schedule to uh, join us for our discussion today and to share his perspective and long-standing political experience. Mr. Koop, thank you and welcome. 
Secondly, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Thomas Schiller, who is an esteemed CAS colleague of mine and who is directing our regional program Sahel, which is located in Bamako, Mali. In that function, he is responsible for the implementation of the CAS activities in the so-called uh, D5 states of Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Chad and Burkina Faso. And we are actually especially happy to have him with us today, seeing that uh, the current political circumstances in Mali um, are everything but stable at the moment. And there was quite a reasonable concern that his internet connection or power would not hold up. So Thomas, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Last, uh, but of course, definitely not least, I would like to welcome Mr. Tom Bays. He is not only a China-Africa researcher, and most recently a fellow at the Makata Institute for China Studies here in Berlin, but he is, of course, you will have recognized him, the author of the study that we are going to present today. His research so far has um, examined mainly the economic, technological and security dimensions of China's engagement uh, with both Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa. And furthermore, he has previously worked on EU Africa policies at the UK permanent representation to the EU in Brussels. Uh, so far, he has conducted research in numerous African countries, uh, including, of course, Western African nations that he visited uh, during his field research for the study that we are presenting today. Lastly, I would uh, like to express my sincere gratitude to our partner Merix, who has been a part of this project from the very beginning and whose expertise on all China-related issues tied in perfectly with our foundation's interest uh, in security issues, one of the core topics that we actually are dealing here um, at CAS, so that was um, a perfect cooperation, as one can say, and I would highlight, I would like to highlight that at this point of the event. And at that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will leave it and I will hand it over to Mr. Bays. Without much further ado, he is going to present to you. Um, some insights uh, regarding the genesis of the study, the research that he did on the site, and of course the most important results and findings uh, that he uh, came to conclude in uh, in the phase of his research. Thank you, Mr. Bayes. Thanks, Anna, and thanks, of course, to all of the uh, participants in the audience. Thanks for joining us today. And I would, of course, also like to take this opportunity to thank the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for its uh, generous support for this project. So I'm just going to get this. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, can everybody see my um, PowerPoint presentation okay here? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I'm going to, for the next 15 minutes, as Anna says, just give a brief overview of the project and its findings, uh, which will of course form the basis for our discussion today. Um, and so hopefully everybody can now see the, the PowerPoint presentation on screen with a few slides to follow. So it is sort of scene setting. I think it's fair to say that when most people think of China in Africa, we tend to think of uh, more economic and commercial dimensions of, of their interactions. And that's fair. Those economic aspects do continue to be central. However, what we've seen in recent years is a substantial increase in China's engagement in African peace and security affairs. We see this, for example, in its growing involvement in UN peacekeeping operations, in conflict mediation, arms supply, and also military training. And then, of course, the 2017 opening of China's first overseas military base in Djibouti in East Africa uh, really focused a lot of attention on China's growing security role. And I think it's also important at, here at the out stage to register the fact that this, these developments are the result of a conscious and stated Chinese policy. So for example, at the 2018 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC for short, peace and security cooperation was identified as one of the eight priority areas for China-Africa ties. And then the creation in 2018 and 19 of the China-Africa Peace and Security Forum really underlined the fact that this is an area where Beijing not only wants to make progress, but also wants to be seen to be playing a role and making progress. So with this project, of course, our aim was to try and shed light on, on these developments. More specifically, uh, three more specific aims were, firstly, to try and assess what China is doing and why. Secondly, to try and assess uh, how China is perceived as a security actor on the, on the African side. 
And then finally, to try and draw out what some of the implications are for Europe as um, one of Africa's existing important peace and security partners. And that's essentially the, the structure for this short presentation now. So you will have gathered from the title that my focus was on West Africa. So just quickly to make sure our terms of reference are clear. By West Africa, I mean principally the member states of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, but also additionally Mauritania, Chad and Cameroon where relevant. So fieldwork was conducted in these eight Af West African countries where I interviewed a range of West African politicians, government officials and senior military officers. I also interviewed officials from international organizations including UN, ECOWAS, G5 Sahel, and then also international, by which I mean non-African diplomats and military attaches, and a range of African and international uh, researchers, NGOs, civil society organizations. So getting into the, the meat of the, the reports quickly then, uh, firstly, the why, you know, what is, uh, what is China hoping to achieve? So firstly, on the one hand, China's goals are quite practical. Um, as many people will be aware, more than a million Chinese citizens live in Africa. China clearly has very extensive economic interests on the continent. And the need to protect both of these is a significant pull factor into African security affairs. And a further um, practical motive is that in a number of different ways, a greater participation in African peace and security affairs enables China to boost its own military modernization, which is a, a real priority of the Beijing government. However, I think it's really crucial to stress the centrality of political motives. So on the one hand, this a greater peace and security role as a way to strengthen ties with Africa, but also on a global level, to en enhance China's uh, standing and influence, especially at the UN, by demonstrating that China is a responsible great power. Turning then to the what, what is China doing? Firstly, um, Beijing has been expanding its military diplomacy in West Africa. Um, this is include, includes more military attaches sent to the region, port visits by the Chinese Navy, and also the signing of a series of uh, defense and security MOUs in recent years. And it's also noticeable that in other diplomatic exchanges, uh, including presidential visits, for example, security cooperation is being emphasized more than was previously the case. And in those exchanges, what Beijing is emphasizing is that its approach to African peace and security is centered on capacity building to support African solutions to African problems, backed up by only restricted multilateral intervention, i.e. peacekeeping. So this capacity building, of course, has an important uh, hardware dimension in the shape of uh, supply of, of Chinese weapons. So China has emerged as the second largest arms supplier to the continent, and West Africa is certainly no exception. In West Africa, Ghana and Nigeria are China's principal arms customers, but Chinese weapons are present throughout the sub-region. Small arms and light weapons, such as rifles, are really key to um, these, these, these trade flows. However, there's low transparency in this category, so it's difficult to gauge the, the exact levels. With major weapons, on the other hand, there is greater transparency, and here we can clearly see that China is becoming an increasingly important supplier, including of increasingly sophisticated platforms such as combat drones. So a glance at the, the map on the right-hand side of the screen gives a sense of the spread, both in terms of ge uh, geographical spread and the range of weapons that China is providing. And I think it's also important to note that China has made, continues to make numerous donations to West African militaries of military equipment, both lethal and non-lethal. So for the Chinese side, clearly these flows support its own military industrial modernization, both with revenue and feedback from combat exposure, something that many of these systems haven't really had to date. From the African perspective, Chinese weapons are competitively priced but also China's no questions asked approach, including around human rights, means that um, Chinese supplies are often uh, quicker and easier to access. And this raises a possible positive contribution in terms of uh, West African armed forces capabilities being boosted at accessible prices. However, one of the things that came out of my, my interviews, my fieldwork, 
with the growing frustration with at least some West African militaries at poor quality or a series of malfunctions, unreliability of Chinese weapons, which will of course limit their utility. Now this capacity building also has its software dimension in the form of uh, military training cooperation. And this is certainly something that Beijing consistently highlights. But I think what's key here is to recognize how China's approach uh, differs from contrasts to um, Africa's other international partners, including Europe and the US. So with China, the focus is quite heavily on the training of African officers taking place in China and largely paid for by Chinese government scholarships. And this is a large and growing program. I go into the numbers a bit more in the main report. But what's clear is that the trend is upwards and that this covers all countries in the sub-region, so across that Franco-Anglophone divide. In contrast, in-country training for enlisted ranks is much more limited. So there are examples it is happening, but it's at a much smaller scale. So combat skills training, engineering training, and also more commonly training in the use of newly acquired Chinese weapons. And then similarly, there have been first steps into joint exercises um, with West African militaries. But again, this, this remains quite small. Uh, these are first steps, certainly small in comparison to the, the large multinational US-led uh, joint uh, exercises that take place in the sub-region, though I might expect this to grow in the coming years. So this balance suggests the, for China, uh, the priority is, is as much on building Chinese influence amongst the current and future leaders of African militaries as perhaps on building African capacity. Meanwhile, Chinese participation in UN peacekeeping operations is arguably China's most active, most visible contribution to African security, and it's certainly an area where China's role has grown considerably, having previously opposed them. China has now become the second largest funder of UN peacekeeping operations, as well as the largest troop contributing country of the permanent five members of the UN Security Council. And it now provides a broad range of personnel types. Um, the map here on the right indicates that China has contributed personnel to all peacekeep UN peacekeeping operations in West Africa since 2000. Um, but here it's, it's important to note how this participation has evolved and grown from originally a handful of military observers in Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire to now um, subsequently in Liberia, greater numbers, including uh, engineering, medical and police units. And then most recently in the ongoing mission in Mali, MINUSMA, also armed infantry, those small, small units. So for China, this participation in peacekeeping is an opportunity to gain operational experience. And it's indeed been something of a steep learning curve when one looks at the performance of the PLA in South Sudan, for example. There's clearly also propaganda and diplomatic benefits for China. We see this in China's self-identification now as the backbone of UN peacekeeping. Uh, and this allows China obviously to, to build up its influence within the UN and thereby shape political outcomes there at the UN. I mentioned on the previous slide that, where, that China has previously opposed peacekeeping operations. Clearly since that time it's gradually accepted UN peacekeeping norms, but this is in an incomplete embrace. And it's important to see how now China is increasingly looking to reshape that peacekeeping policy, the UN's peacekeeping policy, by putting forward a Chinese solution to peacekeeping, which is more anti-interventionist and also against what it terms as liberal peace activities, such as political and human rights activities within multi-dimensional peacekeeping operations, such as that in Mali. And I would argue that this goes against the trends in West Africa, certainly when one looks at ECOWAS, which I'd like to do briefly uh, now. So China has clearly been um, looking to woo ECOWAS. It's currently building and paying for new headquarters for the organization in Abuja. But the peace and security dimension of their, of their engagement remains very limited, some uh, donation of equipment for the ECOWAS standby force. And it seems that this comes down to fundamentally this, this values disconnect where ECOWAS has historically been a much more forward-leaning interventionist um, force in West Africa, including in defense of um, democratic norms, which is obviously something where Beijing doesn't align. And I think that China's approach to another of the multilateral structures in West Africa, the G5, the G5 Sahel, um, is also illuminating. So China 
uh, made its support for the G5 conditional on Burkina Faso, one of the members, breaking its ties with Taiwan. Once uh, Burkina Faso did indeed do that, subsequently there has been uh, some limited Chinese financial material support to the G5, though not for the joint force itself, and also more surprisingly, not for the infrastructure dimensions of the G5's work. So I think the Chinese engagement with the G5 points to this uh, Chinese preference for a more unilateral and identifiably Chinese contributions to peace and security, so things that can raise its status as a security actor. And that's what I'd like to turn to here, is just to try and draw out some of the assessments, West African assessments of China as a security actor, of course, based on my, my interviews in the sub-region. So firstly, I think unsurprisingly, it continues to be seen as principally an economic partner and is surely likely to remain so. It's not seen in the sub-region as a first choice security partner, unlike say the US or France. And here I think it's important to note uh, China's unwillingness and, and really inability to deploy troops for those kind of in extremist interventions such as the UK in Sierra Leone, France in Mali. And this limits, uh, in the view of, in, of my interviewees, limits China's status as a security partner, though of course I recognize that that kind of external intervention is not the first choice preference response to those situations. As touched upon, Chinese weapons are sort of openly welcomed as an opportunity insofar as they prove reliable. And similarly, Chinese training is positively received. But a couple of points that frequently came up in interviews was that China is just one among many such partners. And above all, recurring doubts about the People's Liberation Army having the relevant uh, ex experience and expertise to share, especially on areas like counterterrorism counterinsurgency, which are of course a priority in West Africa. And as mentioned on the previous slide, um, China is felt by many, but certainly not by all interviewees, as uh, somewhat out of step with some of those more pro-democratic interventionist or civil society-led peace-building norms in West Africa, which can also limit its role. But there is nonetheless clearly, I felt, a growing expectation for a greater Chinese role, clearly in line with China's growing influence and presence in the subregion in general. And here I'd say that that growing influence in other domains really does magnify China's um, security role as making it more of a th than the sum of its parts. Now finally, just turning lastly to the implications for Europe, I think we can see this as the emergence of an influential new security actor in a strategically important region. But as noted, China's activities do remain limited in scope, so I don't think that we can expect it to have a significant decisive impact on security dynamics in the near term. And there is as such considerable scope for China to do more and to offer more. But in sum, I think that the, um, the impact for Europe will mostly be felt in the political domain, be it in relations with Africa itself, or also crucially at the global level within the UN. How, how should Europe respond? Um, as such, there's no need to fundamentally alter Europe's approach to African security, at least not directly in response to the, the China factor. Nonetheless, important for, China, for Europe to continue to maintain its political influence on the one hand by uh, strengthening its messaging around its significant contributions to African peace and security, but also sustaining a robust contribution to UN peacekeeping operations such as providing high-end capabilities to individual missions. Strengthened coordination with, with African partners is key, including with African members of the UN Security Council. And then with China too, as its influence undoubtedly will grow, it will be necessary to continue to seek deeper exchange with China on African security affairs uh, in, in the quest for greater shared understanding and coordination. But finally, what about the question of deeper, more active security cooperation with China, something that, where we know that the PLA is interested in greater training exchanges with Europe. I think this has to be carefully assessed in terms of the risks and rewards. I think the final tangible um, policy recommendation I offer in the report is that uh, Europe does need to define a code of guidelines for its interaction with the PLA to identify areas which are um, useful, fruitful cooperation and others where they present greater risks. So that's, that's the outline of um, the project with which I will um, stop the share and hand back over to Anna. Thank you.
very much, Mr. Weiss, uh, very much in time, uh, within the time frame that was given to you, uh, a very comprehensive presentation. And I know that it is always quite a challenge to uh, present an 80 page study within the given time frame of 15 minutes. And uh, I think you've done beautifully. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, um, a number of questions will always remain open. And there are definitely some points that um, I would like to take up again and that what uh, I would like to deepen now in our panel discussion. And uh, in that framework, of course, I would now also like to involve our other speakers. Um, in view of the fact that we have a lot of participants in the audience today whose China expertise is likely a bit greater than their Western African expertise, I would like to uh, start by asking my colleague uh, Thomas Schiller to give a very brief um, description of the current security situation in Western Africa. I believe that some members of the audience have uh, probably been following the news regarding the recent protests in Mali, which have now become increasingly violent over the weekend, and which up to a certain point can also be seen as a direct result of the worsening security situation on the ground. Um, Mr. Schiller, against this backdrop, can you please give us uh, a brief overview of uh, the most pressing security issues in Western Africa at the moment and the most important uh, security actors that we have? Uh, thank you very much. Um, concerning the, the challenges here in the Western African region, um, I want to highlight three uh, which are really well known now and uh, which have uh, um, also a lot of international attention. Uh, first of all, we have a, a very serious security crisis in the center of the Sahel region, um, in, the, uh, uh, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and in Niger. And this security crisis is, uh, uh, has grown uh, over the last years, uh, despite a huge international engagement. And uh, uh, one can say that, for example, countries like Mali and Burkina Faso don't control any longer uh, vast pockets of their territory. We have a second uh, uh, security challenge since a long time also already in the Lake Chad region. So uh, in sharing, uh, shared between the countries Niger, Nigeria, um, Chad and Cameroon where especially Boko Haram and, its, uh, uh, and another terrorist group, uh, ISWAP, uh, is active. And this has been a security crisis also since a long time and it's still a very complicated one and it's still a very costly one also in human lives. Um, then we have a third uh, a security problem uh, which is more linked also to the presentation uh, Tom Bays uh, has just showed us the piracy problem we have at the, uh, uh, at the Gulf of Guinea, uh, where uh, only recently also the uh, Chinese sailors uh, had been kidnapped by, um, uh, uh, by pirates. And this is of course also showing the main problem of a lot of African states. Uh, they are too weak to control uh, their territory in full. They are too weak to ensure security. And uh, this is also a problem uh, in the middle and long term, uh, perhaps for other states, which are not currently affected by, uh, by these crises. But there is a growing fear that, uh, for example, the security challenges will also uh, affect from the Sahel region, the coastal states of the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, concerning the actors, um, the main actor in uh, the Francophone uh, part of Western Africa is, of course, France, still France. Um, uh, it is known that, uh, probably most of you know that uh, France has a huge anti-terror operation running since 2013-14 here, Operation Barkhane, with over 5,000 soldiers deployed on the ground. Um, then we have, uh, of course, the United States, uh, which have uh, a huge partnership programs with a lot of uh, national security forces, but the United States uh, are not as visible as France is. Um, for example, I uh, recall the tragic event when uh, American Special Force soldiers have been killed uh, when they uh, accompanied a Nigerian um, 
uh, unit in uh, near to the Nigerian uh, Niger Niger Mali border, and that was for a lot of people also in the U.S. Uh, uh, very new that these uh, troops were effectively on the ground. So the U.S. is present, France is present. And then we have, of course, a huge presence uh, in, uh, in Mali with, by the international community, the United Nations, Tom Bays just mentioned the MINUSMA, and we have uh, European missions such as EUTM and OICAP uh, for training of the armed forces for the security forces. And in these frameworks, in these international frameworks, also Germany is involved. Uh, Germany is a large troop contributor to uh, MINUSMA and to EUTM, and uh, of course Germany uh, does also uh, a lot of, gives also a lot of bilateral help um, uh, to the armed forces in the region uh, in the framework of the capacity, capacity uh, building initiative um, of the uh, German foreign ministry and the German ministry of defense. So that a brief overview, there are also of course the national actors like G5 already mentioned and ECOWAS already mentioned. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. I think that gives all of us a uh, better setting of, uh, you know, the issues we're actually discussing today. Um, Mr. Korb, uh, my colleague just mentioned, of course, uh, the German and European involvement uh, within the framework of the MINUSMA and uh, the EJM missions. And of course, that is not the only German and European engagement, seeing that uh, we're also flanking this uh, security acting uh, through a quite intensive, extensive economic and uh, development commitment as well. For example, within the framework of um, the Sahel Alliance, of which Germany is also a founding member. Um, yet I think it is safe to say that uh, despite all these efforts and in spite of the intensified cooperation uh, with regional actors such as the G5, we have not yet really come to a sustainable and long-term solution of uh, the current conflict in Western Africa. And this already has in parts led to a negative impact in terms of how traditional Western security actors in Western Africa are being perceived, uh, which can be seen, for example, in the growing, growing negative perspectives of the, the French engagement in the region. Uh, so against this backdrop, I would like to get your assessment of the current security approach of Germany and uh, the European Union in the Sahel region. Do you believe that our strategic approach is sufficient as it is in the moment? Um, or do you feel that we need to become an even more involved and also more visible uh, security actor on the ground, also in order to be perceived as such by our Western African partners? Mr. Kofi, please have to switch on your microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Should work now? Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, the opportunity of being a part of this uh, panel. And I think uh, both Tom and Thomas uh, just uh, mentioned uh, the crucial uh, points. Um, we had the decision in, the, in Parliament uh, some weeks ago uh, concerning MINUSMA and AUTM uh, Mali. And it was not only a discussion on uh, just uh, deploying troops within these two uh, uh, missions, but also of course, a discussion on how is the situation in, in Western Africa in general. And um, well, the, the perception in the parliament was rather desperate uh, because uh, the question was, uh, of course, uh, asked uh, if Mali could uh, become a second Afghanistan for, uh, for European uh, troops. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's very important to um, to come to conclusion that we have to support our African uh, partners. We have to uh, be uh, in this uh, region. We have to deploy our troops into this region. And uh, when I visited uh, Mali last year, um, I think that the soldiers as well said it's a very useful um, uh, mission and uh, they like to be there. and. Uh, it's very difficult uh, conditions if you have just the climate conditions uh, over there. It's probably one of the most difficult mission we have actually in our German uh, Bundeswehr. And we are well aware of that. But I think it's, uh, it's um, absolutely crucial that uh, Europe, that Germany is part of uh, the countries that are, have decided to engage in, in Mali and in, in Western Africa in general. Uh, what 
my impression was when I visited um, uh, Sierra Leone, Burkina Faso and Mali um, last year is uh, that we have to uh, not only concentrate on security aspects, but to have um, a, um, a detailed view on, on economic and development topics as well. Because uh, I think that not every terrorist joining one of the terrorist groups over there is uh, doing that because of Islam, uh, Islam but because of uh, social situation and conditions around there. So we have to uh, have uh, not only security topics on our list, but also development aid. I think, and I think that having, for example, the compact with Africa approach uh, from our ministry, Gerd Müller, is one to join this security approach uh, but we are all very well aware that it will be a long run and it will uh, we will need very uh, intensified um, approaches and I think we are on a good way but we are on the first on the first meters of this way and we will have to uh, walk this way a long time thank you for this assessment um, in that context I would like to uh, Give that question to both Thomas and Tom. As in Mr. Coop uh, rightfully said, obviously this will be a long-term engagement. It is just the first few uh, steps along the way, yet we see, uh, as I already mentioned earlier, uh, the demonstrations in Mali, they, um, they come back to a certain dissatisfaction in the West African population on things moving slowly. So the question would be, um, are the perceptions the same regarding um, the necessity of this uh, engagement being a long-term engagement, the, uh, the, the situation is very complex, or are, getting, are, are people in Western Africa getting a little bit uh, dissatisfied with the current engagement as it is, and would that potentially open up uh, gaps or spaces where, for example, emerging uh, security actors such as China could uh, come in more strongly in the future? Anyone who would like to answer first, please feel free. Okay. <laughs> First, first, Tom, please. Sure. Um, I mean, yes, clearly, I think there's a recognition on all sides, all actors involved, that this is a um, immensely challenging and, and complex situation. Uh, the security challenges in the Sahel, and that's when you look at some of the Chinese analysis written about this. Again, absolutely, they, they recognize this as being a, um, a very complex long-term challenge. And frankly, at times you, you read some of the analysis, you think they're this kind of informs why China hasn't, despite its engagement in Minusma, hasn't rushed to be more deeply involved in the Sahel situation. So there is a certain reticence perhaps, and, and maybe a recognition as well, as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, that the PLA doesn't have the kind of experience um, with some of, you know, combating some of these challenges. Um, I mean, you mentioned about whether or not growing dissatisfaction with what's already on the ground, uh, whether or not that opens the door to China. I mean, that's that's something that one does hear from various sides. When you look at some of the discussions in America, for example, about the possibility of reducing the U.S. presence with this, open a space for China. I don't see it opening a space for China per se. I mean, maybe if I could just touch on Russia, for example, um, that's... Um, you know, I mentioned in my presentation that China is not seen as a first choice security actor. It doesn't also appear to be a, a preferred second choice security actor. In my conversations, my interviews in uh, West Africa, Russia came up much more frequently. And I think Thomas will probably confirm that you're seeing a greater Russian engagement in, in the Sahel. And um, some of that's building on, for example, the situation that um, many viewers might be familiar with of the um, involved, Russian involvement in the Central African Republic with the Wagner group uh, of mercenaries. And this has raised the possibility for, for some others uh, in West Africa to say, well, could, could Russia bring something like that to the Sahel, would that help? So I would say that in terms of opening the door for a new actor, it would appear at the moment that Russia seems more strongly the case, at least in the Sahel, but I'll hand over to Thomas. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes, I do completely agree. So when you, uh, um, on the one hand, one can, um, one can see since a long time uh, a huge disenchantment, uh, for example, in Mali or Burkina Faso with the uh, French presence. Uh, France is sometimes accused of, um, 
as a former colonial power of uh, uh, of not doing uh, things for uh, for the sake of the African countries, but for their own interests. And so France is uh, very much criticized. And when you ask people uh, uh, which other actors could be uh, uh, international actors could be could play a role, then uh, uh, mostly Russia is cited. And uh, as uh, uh, Tom said, uh, cynically, most of the time, uh, Russia is cited because of that what Tom just stated about the PLA. So uh, Russia is perceived as having combat experience. And uh, that's why Russia is, uh, is in some sort of way the, 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 na the name which drops uh, very often in, uh, in discussions with people in the street, but also with intellectuals. Um, uh, another point is still that uh, even when disenchantment with France is there, even when uh, people criticize France or sometimes also the US, um, but uh, when it comes really to the core question of security, most of the people still know that uh, uh, France and the US at some point are uh, uh, the key actors in, for, for providing security. For example, um, in Mali here, or in Burkina Faso, or in Niger, or even in Chad, a lot of people criticize France for its anti-terrorist operation by Khan, but um, everybody knows that uh, um, France is the only international actor also, um, uh, which would be willing to do this um, uh, on the ground, uh, because most people don't like other actors from this political, uh, um, for, for political reasons too. Uh, so for example, Russia would be welcome sometimes in discussions um, uh, as a security power, uh, but it is not considered being a, a political model, for example. So um, that's why, uh, that's why it, when it comes really to the key questions, uh, most of uh, um, most of the people will still uh, uh, will still think about France or the U.S. and the international community, like uh, like the UN to provide for security. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to move on from the Western African perspective uh, to the European perspective, seeing as our title also suggests uh, the implications for Europe is something that we would like to look at a bit more closely today. And uh, in that context, I would like to direct my next question at Mr. Korb. Uh, Mr. Korb, in his study, Mr. Bayes, um, as he already showed in his presentations, has made quite a number of recommendations, and he emphasized on um, the questions that surround intensified coordination and cooperation between China and um, the European Union. In this context, allow me to just very briefly cite a statement that was made by Ms. Ursula von der Leyen um, following the EU-China summit video conference held in June. And I quote, the relationship between the European Union and China is simultaneously one of the most strategically important and one of the most challenging that we have. It is not possible to shape the world of tomorrow without a strong EU-China partnership. Uh, yet in the very same address, um, she also stressed and made it very clear that um, human rights and fundamental freedom are absolutely non-negotiable uh, aspects for the European Union when it comes to the discussion around this potential partnership. And I believe all of these statements reflect quite well um, the tensions and the very complex and multi-layered uh, scope of relationships that we have between uh, China and the European Union. Um, in, in regards to this, um, this statement, I would like to hear from you um, what conditions would you consider to be necessary in order to enable such an intensified collaboration between China and uh, the EU when it comes to shared security challenges and common interests? And where would you personally see the greatest chances and challenges? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's, um, I think it's a good description when you say it's uh, chances and challenges. It's uh, chances, of course, because it's uh, economic power and uh, China is one of our most uh, economic partners in, in most uh, areas, the most important partner. And uh, there is no doubt that China will be uh, this economic superpower in the next uh, decades. So uh, we are we have no other choice than um, trying to have a good relationship uh, with uh, China. And uh, we also, although there are many things you can uh, 
argue concerning uh, China, um, concerning um, uh, multilateral um, approaches, uh, China was uh, in, in some kind more uh, uh, reliable than some partners you normally used to uh, in, in this regard. So um, I think there are chances as well because, of, for example, a topic like uh, climate change is one uh, that Africa is very strongly affected uh, today and of course will be affected in the next decades. And um, we all should have a vital interest in uh, dealing with that problem in, in Africa. And we are all well aware that Europe alone and especially Germany alone will not be able to, to uh, solve this problem um, at all. So there are some approaches, some areas where I think um, a collaboration with uh, China in Africa and in other, other parts of the, the world as well um, could be uh, possible without having the, uh, the, the normal uh, discussion uh, we have in, uh, of course, in, in the Bundestag as well concerning human rights and uh, also if you are, have the discussion on uh, 5G uh, development in, in Germany and Europe and we all know that we have uh, these areas where we have very different approaches, where we have very different values and uh, in, for, in Africa, for example, we have very different interests and uh, well, I was a little bit, uh, I had to smile when I heard last in, in last year's visit in in Western Africa when one of our um, development aid workers from Germany told us that Germany is uh, very well perceived in Africa because the people think that we have no interest in, in that region and of course that is on one way it's, it's nice but on the other hand of course we have interest in that region and uh, in some areas we have a common interest with China in some areas we have a very different one uh, ones with uh, China and we have to stress where we agree and where we do, do not agree. Um, we have, um, I um, agree to, to Tom's analy analysis that we don't have to uh, invent completely new things but to work in the, uh, in the frames we already have, be it uh, Security Council or bilateral um, um, agreements uh, with China. But uh, it will ever, it will always be this, this kind of stuff between uh, chances and challenges that will not stop. And um, I think the, the challenges uh, part will be probably uh, bigger than in, in the past, uh, but uh, the chances are still there. And I think we have um, the chances to, to cooperate with China. But as uh, Tom also mentioned, there are red lines uh, when you see that uh, China wants to uh, to force uh, Burkina Faso to, to break with Taiwan. That's for sure an area where we have, uh, where, where we do not agree and where we have our struggles and uh, challenges to, to deal with uh, China. And uh, the, the European approach should also be to find uh, new partners as well or to strengthen the relationship with partners like India, for example, as well in order to have uh, strategic partnerships, um, uh, not only with China, but also with others. And we all, also, uh, also um, are very well aware that the partnership with uh, the United States, of course, will be still crucial, but uh, we have to find uh, some additional uh, partnerships um, as well in order to, to show that European Union and Germany has interest in that region. Um, but we are on the good side to, to say so, and I think if we uh, find um, a way to strengthen this kind of cooperation, uh, it will be in favor of both for Europe and, and Africa and maybe even China as well. Thank you, Mr. Kopp. Um, you just mentioned, um, for example, climate change now as um, as a potential area where, where China and the European Union would have to work together to achieve common goals. I can think of another example, um, quite recent actually, where China and the European Union um, have both uh, invested a lot of, of money and aid, and that is of course the current uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, both China and Europe have been parallelly actually um, putting huge amount of money uh, to Africa 
in order to assist with uh, COVID-19 relief. Um, yet, you know what I mean, this is uh, an area where one could potentially cooperate more closely in order to achieve um, to achieve the common goal of really offering relief to our African partners. Yet, um, I believe, or it seems that it is very often much more about the actual narrative than, um, you know, the potential outcome. And if one looks at the perception, not just within Western Africa, but in general, one gets the feeling that uh, the European aid, even though it is not less substantial than the Chinese, is not nearly as, as well perceived or not just as well known as the Chinese engagement, which has of course to do with the specific approach uh, that China uses in that uh, connection. And yeah, one gets the impression that Beijing is just much better than the European Union or Germany, for example, to uh, tell the story of being a reliable partner in terms of crisis and in terms of uh, security crises. So um, I pose the question to you first, Mr. Koop, but all of you are please free to answer that. Um, do we also need to work on our own image and do we need to work on our own narratives more strongly to also present ourselves as um, more reliable and stable security partners in the future? Mr. Koop, if you would answer that question first. I I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the last thing. I'm sorry, I meant if we as Europeans or Germans, if we have to also work on our own narrative uh, much more strongly ah. to, you know, present ourselves as stable and reliable security yeah. policy actors. Yeah, of course, I think it's, um, um, I mean, to, to be honest, it's uh, the Chinese approach is uh, quite seductive to, to many countries because uh, uh, China doesn't ask all that questions. Uh, European countries do like uh, freedom of press and freedom of speech and human rights and all these uh, uh, these things. And uh, in, in many cases, it's uh, the easier way to, to have uh, a cooperation with China. But I think when you have a look at countries like uh, Sri Lanka or countries in the, in the Belt and Road Initiative, we are talking later about, uh, I think some countries realize that um, a cooperation with China is uh, not only uh, a chance but has al always some uh, problems uh, because uh, of course China isn't doing all these approaches because they uh, want to, uh, yeah, in, to to have a better world maybe that's one thing uh, one topic as well but because they have uh, political interests and it's okay every country has political interests and uh, uh, when I was uh, in the last uh, electoral period a member of the uh, Standing Committee on Financial Issues, um, we were very proud, for example, of uh, forcing Greece to sell its uh, harbor and airport infrastructure. Uh, and uh, now the, the, the port of Piraeus, for example, is uh, in, in Chinese hands. And I guess they won't do that because they want to... Uh, uh, to foster uh, tourism in the next uh, years, but they because they have uh, political I'm not quite sure if it's just me or if we have just lost uh, internet yeah. connection with Mr. Cope. <laughs> okay, I am. Okay, no, I'm, sorry, you were just you just froze for a second. Now I can hear and see you. Okay, <laughs> but yeah. sorry, I missed I missed that last part of your sentence. Yeah, well, I think, we, of course, we have to, to promote more that we would like to be a re reliable partners. We have interest as well, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't uh, be present with troops and, and personnel. But our approach is another one. We would like to, maybe it's not the, as seductive or as, uh, as fast, but I think it's uh, the more sustainable one. And I think that some countries start to, to realize that. But of course, uh, the, the, our approach or our challenge to be a little bit more uh, offensive co uh, concerning the, the promotion that we are a reliable partner uh, should take place. And uh, I think, like, once again, uh, the approach with uh, Compact with Africa is one a very good one. But uh, it's only one small uh, part. We have to do more and have to show our African partners that we would like to, uh, to secure security and welfare in the next years and would like to be a partner in this. 
Thank you. If uh, the other speakers also have an opinion on that, please feel free to add. But uh, briefly, because we're already a little bit behind time, and I would like to give enough time for the questions of the audience. So, Mr. Schiller, please. Okay. Um, only adding perhaps two, um, two remarks concerning your question. Um, so, concerning, for example, COVID-19, uh, uh, people here, at least the countries I uh, I know very well and I'm living in, uh, they know very well that the virus started in China. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is also something um, where uh, now the Chinese involvement with aid and um, with medical equipment, uh, people are well aware why China is doing this. So uh, um, that's... So. Uh, the other question concerning um, the, the image of... Um, uh, China and the image of Europe. Um, I think the main problem for us is not that we don't have a image or a positive image. We do have in many ways, um, but uh, that our approach sometimes is considered simply too complicated. So uh, uh, we have uh, um, we have highly developed. Um, managerial tools in development aid we have um we, we develop a very um very sophisticated partnership process structures uh, and all this and um uh, uh, in order to avoid corruption and all these things uh, aid is very closely monitored uh, projects are very very complicated to be set up and uh, that's our main Percept negative perception, uh, if you will, uh, also not not that we don't do anything or not that this is not visible, but that is simply too complicated compared to a Chinese approach, um, which is perceived at least um, as much more easygoing, uh, quick, and uh, um, uh, and simple. Anna, I'm, ha I'm happy to sit this one out so we can start hearing uh, and tackling some of the questions from the participants. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, at this point, uh, for now, thank you so much for engaging in the panel discussion. And I can see that uh, we actually have received quite a lot of questions. Uh, seeing that it is already four o'clock nearly, I will just not hesitate any longer and start with the first one. It is not indicated uh, to a specific uh, panelist. So anyone who uh, would like to answer, please feel free. One of the most prevalent and widely discussed issues on the continent is post-colonialism and decolonization. In my discussion around the continent, it is interesting that the role and expansion of China, politically as well as culturally and economically, is rarely viewed as neo-colonialism. Neo is it correct to view China's involvement as neo-colonialism specifically as the infrastructure developments and money being pumped and overshadow the human rights abuses and the huge exploitation of resources such as fishing and woods, etc. Maybe Mr. Bay, seeing that you didn't have a chance to get in the discussion, now you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the the concept of neocolonialism is of course relevant, um, but uh, with regards to China, I do think that it would maybe be uh, more problematic than it's worth to start trying to use that terminology in particular. The Chinese side certainly does benefit from the fact that it is justifiably able to say that it was not one of the European powers or other powers that uh, colonized Africa and it continues to draw advantage from that and I think that's not to be um, doubted the the fact that that continues to be of political utility for the Chinese side. While I do respond with, with um, Skepticism to the use of that terminology there. I think of course it's quite right to be looking critically at what China is doing and why um, And I think the, the Chinese own terminology and rhetoric rather of win-win It tells you in itself that they are quite openly saying that they are coming to Africa to to, to draw benefits for themselves. It's the claim that it necessarily delivers benefits from the African side that I think does need to be challenged. And I think that is something that we do already see to varying degrees, of course, across the continent in different countries, uh, depending somewhat on the political and social situation in, in relevant countries, that there is a domestic criticism or um, 
analysis of what China is doing and what what benefits it delivers to to the relevant country. Uh, and there, frankly, it comes down to the um, the the freedom of the press, the civil society situation in a relevant country. So I think that's best left to those um, um, those African citizens who are well placed to to judge that themselves. But personally, I would just avoid the uh, the neo-colonial terminology as more trouble than it's worth. I think we need to look at it with a maybe different paradigm. Would anyone else like to add on that? Otherwise, I would move on to the next question, which is uh, also addressed to Mr. Bayes directly this time. Touching on what Mr. Schiller said on Chinese having been kidnapped by pirates, do you have information on whether Chinese forces have been increasingly target of attacks by rebel and terrorist groups in West Africa? If so, how does China react? I think this is a question that uh, Thomas Schiller will probably also be able to add on later. Yeah, so um, so that seems to cover two different things, the, the piracy issue and the terrorist issue, and on both sides, both scenarios, Chinese uh, nationals have been victims in different ways. I think um, um, on both fronts, um, there is a sense in which Chinese nationals might be particular targets. This is not necessarily the case, but um, when one looks, for example, in those countries with significant uh, Muslim populations, there clearly is increasing um, discomfort and anger with the treatment of Muslims and Islam in China. I think people are all aware of the um, very grave uh, situation there. And that is cutting through uh, in popular awareness in West Africa of that. So I think that does raise the dangers for Chinese nationals um, as a target for some of these terrorist groups. There have already been a number of instances of Chinese nationals being uh, the victims tragically of such terror attacks. Um, and as I mentioned in the presentation, this does encourage a Chinese engagement with uh, some of these challenges. On the other hand, the, the piracy issue, uh, the latest is just the latest example of, of a large number. I don't think that um, Chinese nationals, Chinese ships are specifically targeted, although I can also point out that uh, the very significant role of Chinese trawlers in illegal and unregistered overfishing off the coast of West Africa is something of which a lot of those communities are acutely aware uh, and could also contribute to uh, a negative perception of Chinese and China. Um, but with regards to piracy, I think um, this hasn't meant that China is specifically a target. But as I do touch on in the report and explore in the report, China has shown a sustained interest in this Gulf of Guinea piracy issue. Uh, it's tended to go its own way rather than treating it multilaterally as we would perhaps prefer. Um, so it's definitely something that registers, it's something that is reported in Chinese media, for example, so uh, Chinese would be aware of it. Mr. Schiller, would you also like to touch on that? Perhaps one or two sentences. Um, uh, Chinese nationals are surely not the main target of terrorist groups. This is still the case mostly for Westerners. Um, uh, for example, here in the Sahel region, uh, of course, French are the, 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 most, um, the most obvious target for terrorist groups, groups because of the French um, uh, engagement with the anti-terror mission Balkan. Um, but uh, there were always sometimes uh, some hijackings for example lately a few months ago uh, in Burkina Faso um, an employee of uh, Huawei telecommunication groups was hijacked but was very very quickly released also after that so um, it so Chinese nationals uh, I would say are not the primary target of terrorist groups here in the Sahel region thank you um, I will skip a couple of questions that we sort of already touched on uh, now in our answer to that specific one. Um, here's one I find quite interesting, and I think Mr. Koop would uh, be the best person to answer that one. Are European countries focusing uh, on the common values shared by Europe and Africa when building partnerships, and are they communicating about these shared values?
Sorry for that, yeah. Uh, well, I think they do. Um, not in every time enough. And uh, of course, uh, we have some problems with uh, uh, some countries in, in, in the African continent concerning uh, the same values, but uh, the vast majority uh, for sure is uh, same uh, direction. So I think uh, we, that's one thing we should stress more. It's uh, when we have this, uh, and I have to mention it once again, for example, the, the Compact Africa, this tries to show that it's not something to where, where, where Europe is uh, talking about Africa, but talking with Africa and trying to find solutions together and finding new ways of uh, cooperation. Uh, and um, I think that's a, a very good approach. Uh, it, as I said, it will be one that uh, will last many years. Of course, everyone knows that we will not have all our goals uh, achieved uh, within some years, but um, I think we have to to um, yeah to increase this in the future. We have uh, many many area political areas where we have uh, same ideas, same values, and we should uh, concentrate on these and uh, cooperate in these fields. And it's not only strategic and only um, uh, security um, uh, approaches, but also um, economic one, climate change, as you mentioned, COVID-19. So I think we should really um, have a close partnership. Uh, in the same word, it's partnership. And it's not only talking about each other, but with each other and finding solutions together. And uh, I think we are on a good way. But um, yeah, when I talk to um, African politicians, uh, you feel that they would like having the, especially the German ones to be faster and uh, yeah, as uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was Tom or Thomas who said that it's too complicated. I think that's what we can very good uh, in Germany. We can make it very complicated, but maybe we should make it uh, a little bit less complicated and more uh, emotional and then it, it works together. Thank you. Are we, are we working on that, Mr. Kopp? <laughs> I, I mean, think so, yeah. Complicated, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, there is a question I would also like to tackle that I find quite interesting. Is there a difference between China's security role between West and East Africa? And if I might add, uh, maybe also Southern Africa or the rest of the continent. And if so, how can this be defined? I think that would be a question for Tom. There we go. Yeah, no, that's definitely an interesting question. That's something that I'm interested in as well. I know that you and I have separately discussed this at, at times, and this is part of the question of picking West Africa rather than one of the other sub-regions of Africa for this particular case study. And the, part of that decision was a recognition that there are things that are um, Comparable, comparable across the continent and China's approach could be comparable across the continent but then of course a recognition that West Africa and indeed the challenges it faces are quite different from some of the other regions so I don't think that you could do a very straightforward definition of okay this is China's approach in East Africa its approach in Southern Africa etc um, but I think it, it, it draws more on um, the kind of pragmatic response to what the nature is of China's existing relations with a given country, what its interests are in a given country. So to take two examples is existing relations with Tanzania have encouraged it to have more active um, military cooperation exchanges in Tanzania. So in my presentation, I mentioned how limited the um, Chinese joint exercises are in West Africa. In Tanzania they've they've gone much further already so that's why I would think we can expect in time to see more of that happening across the continent that's based on the warmer political relations and then the second example I would point to would be uh, Sudan and South Sudan um, previously one country now two countries where China has extensive economic interests and also um, those interests exposed to considerable conflict and, and dangers and that has clearly led China to take a different approach. China is present within MINUSMA but that is despite its quite limited economic presence in, in Mali. They're not completely absent but it's minor compared to South Sudan and I think you can draw a pretty straight line between that and the fact that the Chinese 
um, contribution to South to, to the UN mission in South Sudan is much larger, much more substantial, a much larger number of combat troops. So um, there are those differences. I admit that the West Africa case study uh, gives maybe the impression that it can be defined in a, a series of narrow ways. It's not so much that case, but it's just when you look in case by case across the continent, China takes a different approach kind of pragmatically. Uh, thank you. I have, I'm just having a look at the clock and as I feared and mentioned earlier, uh, of course, we're not going to be able to ask, uh, to answer all these questions that have been asked here today, seeing that it is 10 past four and we are more or less uh, at the end of our program. What I would like to offer, if uh, there are any really urgent questions that you would like to answer, uh, please feel free to address them to the email address that has been linked uh, with the invitation and we'll see if we can try to get an answer to you uh, through that channel later on. Um, I would like to give each panelist uh, the opportunity to just make a brief closing statement before we end uh, the session for today. Uh, Mr. Koop would like to start. Yeah, well, thank you. I think it was a very good um, idea to have this uh, kind of conversation. It's, uh, um, it's always good to have uh, the, the information from uh, the experts uh, and I think what is clear that uh, there are Chinese interests uh, in, in this region, we have to deal with it and uh, we have to find ways how to cooperate with China where it is possible. Uh, also, also, we have to say uh, clearly where um, fields are that where there, there's no cooperation uh, possible as well and we have to stress to our values, but I think uh, we should all do this in order to uh, to encourage Africa to become uh, a secure and uh, well uh, continent in the next uh, decades. This will be a huge challenge for all of us. I think it's uh, quite clear that uh, Europe or the, the West uh, will not be able to manage this um, alone, but we have to find our uh, partners. And I, I'm very convinced that China can be a good partner in many of these areas and of course there is a competition in some kinds uh, and uh, our um, aim should be to to uh, present uh, that germany that the european approach always is one that is maybe some uh, little little bit slower and more complicated than other approaches but it's a re reliable um, and sustainable one and um, i think if we are able to to show this uh, to our african partners and uh, to be also clear in, in our society that uh, the engagement, especially in security uh, matters, uh, for example, in Mali, will be um, a very difficult one, a very long lasting one. Um, but if we are aware of this, uh, I think it's a good future where we can have with our, America, um, our Asian uh, <laughs> African partners. I'm sorry for that. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, also c come to the region as fast as possible, uh, although it's uh, not able at the moment, but uh, especially to, to Thomas, I hope that the security situation, especially in, in Bamako, will uh, be better in, in some weeks and uh, days. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, say thank you to the Konrad Adenau Stiftung once again, a very uh, good um, meeting and um, I'm, Whenever it's possible and whenever I'm invited to be part of such a panel, I'm uh, glad to be so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad for having you today. Thank you. Um, I would like to give the word to Thomas. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, Mr. Cook, you're always welcome. As when flights resume, I hope we... Uh, we can, uh, we can arrange a visit uh, very quickly. Um, from my point of view, perhaps only two or three remarks. Um, uh, first of all, um, I think we should, um, uh, and that's why I think this study is also so important, um, we should uh, l take a very close look on all these multitude of actors which are now uh, present in Africa, here in Western Africa, but also uh, elsewhere. Um, also for another very simple reason. Um, very often uh, there is also, um, there are also things uh, where 
um, uh, there is some sort of competition now starting between all these actors and this is contraproductive for African development. Um, so, for example, when Chinese uh, actors or Russia or others, uh, we didn't talk about Turkey, for example, um, uh, uh, when all these actors, new actors in some sort of way come to Africa, of course, there will be a, some a kind of competition and this, this might not be always a good thing for, uh, uh, for, for African development. Um, second thing, uh, security situation. Uh, from my point of view, only when I'm here and um, when I'm going around here in, uh, in Mali, in Bamako, even when we have, as uh, uh, Tom just mentioned uh, a, few, uh, a few minutes ago, even when we have a large Chinese contingent uh, uh, at MINUSMA, uh, they are uh, really rarely, very rarely visible uh, uh, somewhere in uniform. So they, they do a very low profile uh, approach to this and this might uh, uh, be explained by that what you said in your presentation, Thomas, that um, uh, China is still learning a little bit and is still trying to keep low profile because when you compare this even to, very, to, to, to smaller nations uh, uh, which uh, not that amount of troops at MINUSMA, they are really nearly visible nowhere as Chinese soldiers. Um, and this, this is perhaps con, uh, underlines what you just mentioned before, that uh, many of these operations for China are still uh, part of their learning curve on uh, security in the international framework. Thank you. And thank you, Anna, for organizing all the, all the evidence. Of course, it's been my pleasure. And it's always good to see that uh, the experience on the ground actually lines up with the experience and the findings of the study. <laughs> and uh, I think the last word today should obviously be with uh, the author, Mr. Bays. Uh, any last words for today? Yeah, okay, just a couple of last words. Firstly, to say that um, I think this is an issue that's not going to go away. It's going to only grow in importance. And so for that reason, I'm very happy to have been able to uh, make this small contribution to what is a growing body of analysis of uh, Sino-African peace and security interactions. So uh, I think that that's great to be able to participate in that. Uh, so of course, I warmly invite all participants who haven't yet had the chance to, to read the report. And I'd just like to repeat my thanks from earlier to everybody for coming along and participating and also second what Anna said a minute ago inviting people to to share any additional questions that they have based on the discussion now or indeed on the report itself via the email that she pointed to I look forward to, to seeing such questions so thank you all very much well, thank you to our panelists and of course, uh, thank you very much to our audience uh, for being here with us today, for posing your questions. I know this format is of course not as interactive in terms of discussion with the audience uh, as we are used to, but uh, we're doing our best with what we can do at the moment. And we hope that regardless of, you know, the constructions of not being physically together and being able to discuss that you have found uh, this session informative. Um, just a few words, if any of you have not received the email, the study can be found uh, either on the CAS homepage or the Merrick's homepage. And uh, specifically for our Western African participants, because I saw in the registrations that we have quite a lot of people from Western Africa joining in today. Uh, we are currently discussing of having a similar event like that in French uh, in the Western African context with uh, Western African panelists a later time of the year. So if you are interested in participating in such an event, you are also free to drop your email at any time and we are going to invite you once that has uh, transpired a bit more specifically. So yeah, I think in the very brief time frame that we had, uh, we actually managed to uh, answer quite a lot of questions and tackle quite a lot of issues. And uh, with that notion, I think it is safe to conclude. And uh, thank you so much for participating and uh, have a nice afternoon still. <laughs> Goodbye.